off. I'm sure some more people will join in along the way. Um, so if you guys, if you want to be um, part of the conversation, please turn your camera on. If you just want to kind of uh, lurk, feel free to, but, um, but I won't call on you. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to say hi. Uh, so I'm Jen Fine. I'm the co-founder of You Live to Travel, and we're the hosts of this community meetup. And um, we haven't done this in, in a couple of weeks because I've been busy with some other panels and things like that, but um, just really got this kind of jolt of hope because I've just been reading article after article of, um, if not actual opening, that governments are starting to publish, you know, plans for reopening and, um, you know, I just thought, well, look, travel takes a long time to plan. So, um, seems like maybe now's the time to start doing what Ben just mentioned, which is to start planning for what it's going to look like when we can get back out there and thinking about how that's going to be different and how that's going to be more domestic or even just regional, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give everybody a chance to kind of talk about these things and wanted to hear some stories from various places um, just to kind of get a patchwork picture of, of what that reality is. So, well, actually, I guess let's get started with you, Ben, because I know you've been super active. Um, so tell us what you've been up to. Well, we've had a roadmap laid out by uh, federal government here in Australia. I am based in Queensland, one of the eastern states, which has had um, very few infections in the last few days. So they seem to be opening up this roadmap of opportunity for groups of this weekend was Mother's Day here in Australia. So they allowed two families to merge together um, in theory. Um, and then in a month's time, they're opening it up to groups of up to 20 people. And it seems very much like it's national parks, campgrounds. And then in another month after that, so beginning of July, 12th of July, they're looking at groups of up to 100 people. So it sort of gives us a bit of um, opportunity to look at moving uh, we're a fairly small group anyway, 20s are probably our biggest ever group. So we're looking at what we can do within the state of Queensland. Yeah. And I've just been on the, like I said, just been on the, on the phone to uh, the landowners, the kayak companies, the bike companies to see what they have to do. Because obviously it restricts size of minibus. Um, if you can go in a double kayak with somebody, because you know, somebody you don't know if you're that close to them. So we're sort of starting to roll out stuff and tease people on social media now. Um, looking at expressions of interest, looking at deposits paid, because people are wanting to do things. They just need to be given a date and then we can start to roll with it. So we've sort of said um, it's been very overemphasized by our uh, prime minister that there is no likelihood of international travel for the foreseeable future. So we've just had to say, as we base 95% of our trips outside of Australia, this is the, the new ground that we're dealing with. What can we do for our very adventurous people who want to do something mm -hmm. to build the community, confidence in themselves, confidence in travel. So we've just said, let's stick within the state of Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, I think the next step after we leave Queensland is obviously to do something nationwide. And then there's this new trans-Tasman bubble that's been talked about, which is New Zealand's restrictions have been very similar to Australia's. So therefore, the two of them are likely to open up as a partnership. So yeah. my movement of people from Australia to New Zealand seems the most attractive international option that we're going to have for the next six months. And I think just to use a passport and get on a plane is going to be good for people. So <laughs> what it looks like, you know, we've still got to be very careful. We still don't know if we are going to be allowed 10 people on an A380 or 300 people on an A380. We just do not know what that looks like. So slowly but surely, one step at a time, and this feels like, in a month's time, hopefully, we can roll our first trip out. And so thinking about, because I know we talked to you a while ago about, you know, you do a lot of adventure travel, so you manage a lot of risk just generally with your trips. So what, what additional insurance or other sort of risk management strategies are you adopting to take groups out during a pandemic? Well, I mean, again, starting with what we know, starting with the fact that we can't put, we put people in luxury bell tents on the one trip that we're looking at in Queensland. We can have two people in there at a maximum. We can have two strangers in there. They're mesh fronted. So they have air so, airflow in there. Um, it comes down to even the, the campgrounds that we use, their health and safety, that they're going to have to up for sanitization. Um, like I said, who, how many people can you put into a kayak? How many people can you put in a minibus? All of this is new, very new risk assessment chapters mm. we will have to endorse. And what it will ultimately do is push up prices because it will mean that we will have less people 
we, we usually do quad share bell tents. We can't do four people in a big bell tent now, so that will double the price of the hire for that. It will change the way that we can do the catering. Will we be able to do catering outside in the winter? Possibly. If not, where do we do it as a wet weather plan? So there's all these different things that we've really had to look at to work out if we can roll it out with the new restrictions on people, but also with the health and safety side of it. Have you thought about having any kind of rules around they have to have passed some sort of COVID test to be able to go on a trip with you or anything like that? No, we haven't, to be honest. I haven't thought that deep in it at all yet. I mean, that's going to be something that I imagine it will be a self-assessment form. It will probably have to be a temperature check on arrival that mm -hmm. we will have to do just as a, we'll do what we can. It might not be the most, you know, rigorous guidelines on what you can do but we'll do what we can when our people arrive and in the 48 hours leading up to it to, to assess to see how they are but you know with a 14-day incubation period it's gonna be very hard to try and self-isolate people in the lead up to the trip or post-trip so i think we just can go with what we know that's a really interesting sort of idea that like before you go on a trip maybe you become a bit more isolated to make it safer for you to go i hadn't hadn't occurred to me until mm. saying that, but like just being a responsible traveler, maybe that's something you might um, consider doing. Although I suppose it depends on where you are, whether or not there's any amount of um, <laughs> you know, more restrictions that you can put on yourself. Um, and we were just talking to um, Kenny. Kenny is based in the Seattle area. And so he was saying that they've just started to open up some of the state parks. Is that correct? From what I've heard, yes. Um, I was just thinking, listening to Ben um, in one of my uh, other calls, someone who works with um, a glamping company was talking on a previous call about what they're doing and with the restrictions that are being sort of relaxed and you know how they can help um, quench that travel thirst for people who want to try and glamp, but the stuff they're having to put in place now. Um, I really can't speak for them, but I remember them saying that um, they're increasing, you know, they're, they're looking at increasing the timing between reservations so that they have adequate time to clean. Mm. Um, and those are um, things that I remember and just, you know, thought of when Ben was talking about them. Do we, do we have a sense of kind of the liability of, of that? So in terms of, you know, it, so obviously the right thing to do is to sort of clean the tents more and things like that. But um, has, has there been any situations where we know kind of what is the liability of the, if somebody come later develops COVID, um, is there any kind of expectation like um, that that can kind of blow back on an operator or not? And yeah. um, that's uh, that I suppose is something that's yet to be challenged, right? Because we've all just been in such lockdown. There's no um, examples of this, right? No, there's no legal framework to work to in a way. No one's produced a guide that we can do the bet. We can do best practice as mm -hmm. much as we can based on what we've been told over the last few weeks. And we can implement that as best as possible for every touch point that we have or sanitized touch point that we have but every operator so we we are in a way we bring in a kayak company we bring in a glamping company we bring in a, a mountain bike company so we have had previous relationships with them all of them exercise their caution on the phone with me this morning about what they are trying to do so they're all aware and are doing that but i suppose exactly that um, who knows what the legislation is going to be for any of these companies for the future yeah and i mean i suppose adventure travel is probably the right model to be kind of leveraging, right? Because you're, you're dealing with uncertain um, risk factors in mm. adventure travel already in terms of you can only do so much and there's always going to be some tail risk, right? So, um, so I suppose the kind of the way that you already operate, you're kind of uh, best prepared of any, um, any travel company in terms of the thought process required. Yeah, my, my mind instantly falls to the insurance of it all because that's one of our biggest overheads that we have in the course of a year. But our biggest overhead was based on the fact we were going to the world's highest road, we were going to every space camp, we were going to the Arctic. If all, they've all been pulled back and we can't travel internationally, we're very much looking at a domestic tour operator's policy for the next 12 months based around a, a, a much heavier risk assessment 
that's based around hygiene and sanitation and personal space and things like that. So it's definitely going to change when I go for my policy, which I've let expire in the last couple of weeks. When I go for my new one there, that's going to have a lot of different look to what it was 12 months ago. Tighter and tighter at home and domestic, obviously disappeared for international right now. Yeah, and I know um, insurance companies are being very cautious about writing new policies right now. So that'll be one of the things mm. you know, um, to see kind of how they how they adapt. adapt. They don't have any models, right? So insurance companies are all based on actuarial tables of, you know, 20 years of data tells us how much risk we can take on and they don't they don't have any of that. And data. knowing insurance, they will over regulate and overcompensate to cover their asses. So naturally as they would. <laughs> there you go. That's another area that the governments can kind of step in and try to push companies to do, you know, to, to support um, what's necessary to kind of, I guess, reopen. Cause it seems that governments are now starting to push towards, you know, support businesses being able to reopen. So I'm wondering if it's going to start to be um, more pressure, like, in Australia, it was like JobKeeper, and um, I think America, they sent checks out to people and things like that. So um, I'm wondering if maybe the next round is actually backing insurance companies, basically, mm. so, that, so that they can insure people to, to reopen, right? Because if there's this massive unsure, uh, you know, uncertainty around that, then, you know, I mean, obviously, Ben, I'm not surprised that you're you're on the forefront of uh, just getting out there and trying things. Just getting cabin fever. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about where you're going. <laughs> uh, so we've done this with a couple of corporate trips. So we're really rolling out some things that we've done for local corporate organizations. So we have some lovely rivers around here. They go through some beautiful national parks. So we're going to go and do one day on a kayak double kayak trip down the river overnight glamping on the banks of the river the next day there's an old rail trail that mountain bikes can go on now that's all been graded and is a really easy easy route so we're going to go and do a second day on that a minibus everybody in a minibus everybody out it's simple it's community building we're not going to make money from it we just want to get our community out doing things again because the on sell for that is that they'll talk and in the future when we can go to Africa when we can go to the Arctic they'll be you know they're waiting to go with us hopefully so it's about getting people confident again and and I guess this sort of not being able to make money on that is partly because it is such a more expensive thing just to deliver already right it, it is Australia by its nature is the most expensive country we operate in we go to New Zealand and it's 60% of the cost of Australia we go to the Arctic and Norway and it's the same cost as Australia so to go and do an Australian adventure for Australians they always go, oh God, I wouldn't pay that much money to do something in my own country, but that's the only option we have. So we can't, we're not going to do it and make a fortune because we don't want to. We just want to cover our costs, get people's confidence up and get people immersed back in nature and the outdoors. Yeah. Well, so um, Karen, you're another Australian uh, based operator and, um, but you take people overseas. So are you planning some domestic ones as well? Um, I run a, I run an Australian trip every um, July, <laughs> so the timing is terrible. I've got one for this July, but it's probably not going to happen mm. in New South Wales, so we're probably not going to be able to go there. Because you can't cross the border, is that right? Yeah, well, we need to fly there, <laughs> whether mm. we can yeah. get there. But, but I'm, I'm different because I'm also a teacher, so I can only do stuff in school holidays. Yeah. I'm really still holding out to be able to take people to Bhutan. That's yeah. yeah I can't. I can't really do much domestically. So there's there's two sides of it, right? There's the Australians can't leave the country, right? We're not even allowed, as far as I know, unless there's an emergency situation, we're not allowed to yeah. leave. But then there's the other side of it. Do you have any sense of when Bhutan is gonna allow guests? No, and you know it really depends on India because the majority of tourists that go to Bhutan are Indian and the numbers of um, coronavirus have been rising in India. So if India can control the virus, the borders might reopen. Uh, Unless Bhutan says only people that arrive by air. Well, I mean, this is one of the things that we were starting to kind of wonder is whether or not there's gonna start to be sort of like the Tasman bubble 
but in the same way, like maybe then Bhutan, if they have controlled it really well, maybe they only allow visitors from the Tasman bubble and Taiwan and South Korea. Like, do you guys feel like that's a likely scenario, given your experience with these countries? I, look, I think, um, yeah, Bhutan has controlled it really well. They've only had a handful of cases and they've had no deaths as well. Um, but I, I reckon as soon as um, Singapore airport opens up or Bangkok airport opens up, I reckon we can go. Mm. Yeah. And so it's, how, it's what happens. My, my, my only fear with that sort of thing is then our guests, our clients coming back into the country and are they going to have to say that extra 14 days off work or to work from home to self-isolate to satisfy the fact they come from overseas? That's my, my quandary at the moment is what will, we, what will they have to do? Yeah, yeah, the coming back part of it. But I'm wondering if if it's going to be the kind of thing where if they let you go at all, it's because it's considered as safe as Australia. And so, you know, like like the Tasman bubble, presumably, if we can go to New Zealand, we can come back without being quarantined, mm. right? Yeah, Maybe yeah. It's sort of like um, these countries kind of defining safe routes in it's like if you go anywhere else then you have to come back and quarantine but if you go to the sort of safe countries like I'm, that's what i'm imagining is going to start to happen um but i've so one of the things we're we're wondering is um you know is if you can go do you think people will go and so your concern ben is like if they can go but they have to come back and quarantine for 14 days then mm, yeah, yeah and, and, and our, so we've got a group, so our two big trips, two of our big trips this year, we've got people that are currently booking to go to the Arctic or Norway in January, and I've got bookings still being taken for that, so they're optimistic, they're Australian audience that are going to try and do the Arctic Circle. I've also got people that are meant to be going to Africa, Tanzania and Uganda in July, who are all saying, we can't go this year, we know that, we'll just push our, push our booking forward to July of 2021. But they're the countries that are probably right at the bottom of that list of when will we get access to be able to go back into continents and countries that have either very little testing or very little control over their borders. So the fear is you know, people want to go. They're adventurous of mind. They want to go on the trips. But when will governments from Australia recognise those smaller countries that have got less health um, protocols and barriers on them that will allow them to freely move back in. So it's just, it, again, we just don't know week on week. At the moment, Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, is saying very much international travel is off the cards for the foreseeable future. And I think the foreseeable future for um, Singapore and hubs like that is probably closer. But yeah. going to Africa or going to some restricted parts of South America or going to India, the north of the Himalayas, I think they are very much... I don't know a time scale, but they're the last back on the run for us. Well, I know because we, we have friends in Argentina who are still, they, they can only leave their house to go to the supermarket and the doctor, nothing mm. else. Mm. So like everything else. So they were like, we showed them pictures that we went to a food truck this weekend to get some food and they were like, wow, at least you can do that. Mm. <laughs> um, but in, in a sense, that's identical to New Zealand. That's the, that's the same heavy controls, almost like stage four lockdown that yeah. New Zealand had, which allowed people to spread their wings earlier to get back out again. Yeah. And so, oh, I'm just gonna admit one more person. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, the, this is this is one of those things I'm wondering, um, I guess without a framework, um, like have you guys heard of any kind of tourism board or, or entity that's trying to create a framework that says like, if you're an operator that like works at this level, you know, the, like if you took people to the Arctic Circle, for example, like, I mean, let's be honest, it's a pretty isolated place, right? So, yeah. you know, um, if you follow certain protocols and you're taking them to, to known destinations, can, can, your, can your group or your operation be kind of like certified safe to the degree where like, oh, okay, well, if you're doing that and you're doing it with this operator, we have confidence that they've met this standard so you can go and come back and not be in quarantine. Does that seem at all feasible or is that just way too hard? I think it'll come. I think it'll be a while. I mean, we, Tourism Queensland, which is our state tourism operator, um, or state tourism operator organization, they are very forthright and very quick to bring out 
openings and opportunities for tourism based companies to do things again. I just feel like some of the countries that we go to, they just about have a marketing organization. So to put frameworks in place, yeah. to say that and work out the restrictions and who can and who can't, I think that might not ever happen. I think it's just you take your risk, you pay your price, but it's going to again, look at travel insurance now. So we have to, the only way travel insurance will cover our clients is if it is safe to travel. And at the moment, there is a blanket from Australia that right. says smart traveler says, do not travel, do not travel, do not travel. So you can't even get travel insurance to go out of the country to go. And therefore that's probably the finite risk of when, when government says you can go, every doorway will open. Okay. Right. And this gets back to that insurance problem again, right? Yeah. Which, yeah. But, um, until the governments give a baseline sense of you're allowed, then you can't get insurance. And then, um, and my understanding is that uh, from a previous conversation with um, an insurance person that we had on a previous meetup, mm -hmm. because COVID is now a known thing, you can't insure against it. So, yeah. Um, it's a known risk and they won't cover you for it. Now, I don't know if that's going to change. Like, have you heard of any travel insurance companies coming up with a product that would say like, as long as you follow these safety protocols, nothing will be covered. But, um, I, I suppose it just kind of comes back to like, um, I mean, you know, actually this is a question maybe you would know. So previously, like if I went to Africa, I was at risk for getting malaria. Would that have been covered by my travel insurance if I did get malaria, even though it is a known risk? Uh, I, I mean, we, we take clients and clients take the risk that they're going to countries where there is malaria. If they take their prophylactics, if they take their medication, they have the choice to do that. Some who've lived in South Africa before say I'd rather recognize the symptoms than treat it. I don't know how travel insurances go on that. To be honest mm -hmm. with you, I've always been of the mindset that if I get something that's going wrong with me with malaria and I've taken my medication and I get it, then I have cover. Thank you for asking. I need to look at that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're all going to become uh, somewhat more expert in our fine fine mm. words within our insurance travel insurance documentation. Um, but I think so. To me, what's coming next is is things like what Ben's doing in terms of creating those sort of regional experiences. So, for example, Karen, are you thinking you might change your July trip from being in New South Wales to being something in Victoria, for example? Um, maybe. Yeah, possibly. We'll have to rethink it all. <laughs> well, there's mm -hmm. going to happen, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I've, I've also got, I've got people signed up to do you know, go to Bhutan in September and then January and then April. And I'm just wondering, you know, I don't think September's going to go ahead. Mm. So I could possibly run a trip in Australia then instead. <laughs> go do Kosciuszko, that's the, the highest one, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> you, have to pick, you have to pick where you go, though, in September. Yeah. Not well, and it's going to be a snowy winter here in Victoria, I think, in the mountains, by the looks of it. So um, it'll still be snowy in September. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think um, to me, there seems to be a bit of like um, a desire to get out of our houses. And so like even for me, like just going to a food truck now, just up the next neighborhood, it's just like, you know. <laughs> Like I've gone on a real adventure, you know? Um, so it does feel like we've shifted in, into Ben's point. It's like previously they wouldn't have paid to go on this kind of experience in Queensland. They'd rather pay the same amount and go overseas, right? So it seems like we're gonna get very internally focused as travelers. Like we're gonna sh like change our expectations um, and sort of accept and maybe just discover our own countries a lot more than um, than, you know, previously, um, which has its pros and cons, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I suppose then, um, one of the questions that we've sort of wondered for you guys, like, is there anything different about the way you operate domestically, like, or, or, you know, locally, like if you were, if you are thinking locally, that change, Anything other than just the, the location and your operators? No, I think, yeah, I'm with Ben that it just changes the cost so much. Um, that's the big thing for me, that mm. it doesn't cost almost as much to travel in Australia as to go overseas. 
Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I guess there's kind of a there's a safety net that we have by travelling domestically, that we know that we're covered by our health system. You know, wherever we go in the country, so that's really good. That's true. So you don't you don't need to have that extra level of travel insurance with regards to health cover. Yeah, right. which I suppose. Uh, so Americans don't have that luxury, actually. Um, but mm -hmm. I suppose they don't, <laughs> they don't. They sort of don't have it. Uh, they didn't have it before either. So I suppose mm -hmm. it's sort of the same challenge across the board. Um, so in America, has that changed? Like, is there are they rolling out like a coronavirus coverage? Like, if you get, you know, if you're some, you know. Well, I guess I don't know really how that works. So it's not like a state by state thing. It's just. Um, so if you were to get sick with Corona, do you get covered for that or not? Or is it just like based on your insurance? Is that, is that one for me? <laughs> sure, any, any Americans on the call who know? Like, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard of such a thing happening. Okay. It seems like a sensible thing to do. Like, but. but you haven't heard of any announcement like um, that there is coverage for that? No. All right. Well, there's an advantage for Australians. We're more expensive, but at least, you know, you're, you know, if you do get sick, you can be taken to any hospital in Australia and, and not get stuck with a big bill. So <laughs> put that in our marketing. <laughs> um, I'm just checking. Um, Ami, I see you on the, on the call here, but I haven't um, heard from you. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> That's a hungry cat. Aww. I have to go. All right. See you later, Karen. Thanks. Bye. Um, but yeah, so I think um, I think it's a it's a hopeful moment, but I recognize that it's sort of at that point where um, we can see the end of it, but we're still not there. And I, like my my favorite analogy for this is when I was when I was doing some at night for Kilimanjaro and, um, you know, started at 1130 and in the dark or for six hours, lost track of all time and all sense of space and distance and anything and lost my feelings and my fingers and my toes and was just like, what have I done? I have no idea what's going on. And then you get to that moment where the sun comes up and you're like, oh, <laughs> and it's sort of this transformational moment, even though it doesn't change the fact that you can't breathe and it doesn't change the fact that you've still got a long way to go. <laughs> but just the fact that the sun has come out just kind of like fills your heart with hope and um, gives you that little boost of energy so that you can kind of keep, keep moving. And I, that's kind of what this moment is for me right now, just the conversations about like, Here's how we're going to ease restrictions, and here's how um, here's how we're going to start to live lives again. And so it doesn't mean we're done, and it doesn't mean it's easy, but it's sort of like, but the sun has come up, and we can yeah. kind of see some light um, on a potential future, and we can start to set dates and do things. Uh, so so that's the that's the hope that I'm kind of holding on to. <laughs> So, can, Jan, can I just add one thing I say? I, I used to get a little buzz when I saw an email coming from Yuli and it was an automated payment received. And you would not believe the satisfaction I got seeing an automatic payment received about middle of last week when it was the first one in probably two months. And I saw that come through and I was just like, oh my God, that is brilliant. I love seeing that moment. So you provided a real moment of goodness in the last two weeks. And it wasn't even you, it was your bots working away in the background but something made me smile that felt like, okay, this could be a corner turned in a way. And it might be that we don't get to the Arctic in January when they're planning, it might be the January after, but it was just a little bit of the doorway opening. So thank you for, for having some really smiley bots for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, we're, we're also hopeful that this is when people are gonna start to come out of their hibernation and start to use those tools. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, oh, just seeing a message from Ami. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, I think 
the conversation that we had last week on the, the travel tech panel uh, with ResD and get your guide was, you know, take this time. Like I, it can be really hard to be motivated. Uh, like sometimes you just get sort of like, oh, what's the point? But it's like, you have these moments to sort of work on your CRM or work on your email content or work on, um, you know, connecting up your Zapier to something else and, um, or exploring channels, you know, maybe, you you know you were going to talk to this person about you know sort of reselling your your trips or something and you just never got around to it it's like starting to have those conversations and starting to put um put your content online for what you're going to be planning for because it takes time right i mean mm -hmm. ben I, I feel like um how many hours do you spend like creating your itineraries and oh yeah exactly and and it's good because like exactly what you just said i've been working in the background a lot on our actual our own best life adventures web page now so we have a much better menu system that we've done we've used it as an opportunity definitely um uh the the list of jobs has gone down but it's also gone up in a way because i think we've looked now at if something like this was to go on again how fallible we are as a business how how easily we could you know have all of our income ripped away from us within you know two or three days as it turned into of we could do everything to we could do nothing and how do we do something that is home based that is domestic based that's national based rather than looking at everything big and overseas what is the model that we're going to you know, look at in the future? So it's actually been, you know, it's not a blessing in disguise, but it's certainly given us a bit of a stronger framework for the company. You've been stress tested. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely at that. <laughs> well, um, if there's any other call, um, questions or comments from anybody else, please let us know. But um, and um, Kenny, just in, in your part of the world, are you starting to feel optimistic? I really can't say. Um, I'm not an operator per se, per se like you guys are. Um, I I know that one of my tourism groups that um, uh, a couple people that signed up for an industry fam trip uh, to Kenya um, that was supposed to happen this month, but they postponed it till November. Um, they they've been quietly rumbling has anyone heard from these people at all since they postponed it we don't know what time in november you know so i have no idea what's going on um so that's really I, important right that sort of um communicating effectively and i think that can be really yeah. difficult in, in uncertain times and i guess that's actually a really challenging thing like if you set a date and then like do you postpone it to just like 2021 or do you postpone it to you know november of 2020 like do you you know like whether or not you pick another date and take another shot at it or if you just say look we don't know and so we'll get back in touch with you when we do know and i think that's what's driving most people crazy is like if we could just say january 2021 like i think so much energy would be unleashed if we could just start to plan even for for 2021 um which seems to be the general kind of mentality that i'm hearing from people is like um you know it's unlikely that we're going to be able to deliver overseas um for this year and probably not to africa for example and i that's what i was uh, gonna pipe in earlier when someone mentioned i think it was ben again i totally see myself having to pull out i don't want to pull out Mm -hmm. uh, from that fan trip, but I can see the U.S. saying uh, international travel is right now um, for, until travel, a certain though? point. As Americans, you're allowed to leave the country or not? Right now, it's heavily discouraged. Um, I think the last um, uh, travel advisory from the U.S. The State Department was do not travel. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so that'll mean you won't be able to get travel insurance. So if you do go, you'll have to have some other protection, I guess. Mm. It's a whole, it's a whole um, rewind for me of about five years because now that I've got the travel business and I'm doing it on behalf of other people, it's a hugely different game because, you know, I drove through countries from Singapore to London that were do not travel 
Therefore, no travel insurance would cover me. Therefore, my vehicle was not covered. Therefore, it was my own risk if I wanted to go and do this. And I think some of the clients that we now have are accepting of the fact that, okay, you've told us the risks that are there. We have still told us, to, told you that we want to go and do this trip. It's how my my liability insurance as a company will go. I've got to look at very much fine print now. I told them that Pakistan had the opportunity for things to go wrong in it. I listed it out. They signed the paperwork saying they accepted that liability, which is fine. So they know they want to go. So they know that if their travel insurance is there, it won't cover them for there. But it's as now as me as an operator on behalf of other people, how do I stand in a court of law if they were to catch COVID in Uganda or be hijacked in Pakistan or the bus fall off the cliff in Colombia? How do I as a company now sit from a legal perspective of covering my clients with them accepting the risk of going but mm -hmm. me saying, look, I'll take you and we'll go there and you're paying me to do that. Where does that all sit now? That's the, that's the thing for me that's really up in the air. Because I think people will still say, if we can fly, we're going to fly. If we can go to this country, we're going to go to the country. If we're going to climb the mountain, we're going to climb the mountain. But where are the caveats in that travel insurance that says, okay, at the stage when you were above 5,000 5, meters in Uganda, which had a policy to deal with COVID, we covered you. When you crossed the border into Congo, they didn't have a policy. Therefore, they, we don't cover you for that. There's so many loopholes that I can see with all of this. I think the risk is going to come down to the individual saying, we said we wanted to go and it was our risk. Right. Yeah. I see that quite a bit too, is it comes down to the personal, um, personal risk tolerance. Mm. I have, I have a friend who's um, straight out. She just finished her uh, last round of chemo for breast cancer. And they were telling everybody stay out of the parks. And she was one of the ones in the parks it's personal risk tolerance at that point at that mm. stage what you're saying yeah yeah absolutely and i guess the challenge is um to ben's point it's like but if you're leading somebody then even if they waive their mm -hmm. your responsibility they can't you you can't like waive it all no no absolutely not uh and and that's a really interesting point just in terms of um sort of the future of group travel led by, you know, people like you, ironically, they would be safer led by you. However, it's going to be easier for them to go solo because yeah. it's not that sort of extra level of liability. Because if they just go on their own, you know, there's nobody else accountable for them um, and they can just go. Whereas you might say, no, I can't take on that responsibility of, of guiding you there. So it, it is a bit of an ironic kind of, um, place but i feel like like i said i feel like we've you know you have taken people to dangerous places and um you know i, I feel like the adventure travel mentality and model has got to be the one that kind of gets applied here and we just need more data and so we need people to kind of go out go and, and do it exactly yeah, you know, yeah. And set a tone and be like okay this is working you know Let's I think this is like uh, this is like not just a rock, a stone being thrown in a in a, uh, a pond. This is like a rock being thrown in a pond where they will overcompensate before people appeal so much that they can't move. So therefore, they'll reduce the, the the level of liability or cover, and then it'll slowly but surely even out. And that could be you know a five or a ten year window before mm -hmm. we get stability and people that travel and people that ensure about traveling or take you to travel are happy with the conditions that are set. And I think naturally everybody is going to massively overcompensate to start off with to yeah. cover ourselves so we don't all end up killing our grandmas and ourselves mm. by spreading this disease and that's just one of the things we've got to deal with i suppose knowing mm. that for the next five years it's not going to be nearly the same as it was maybe even the next 10 years we're not going to have that same freedom to move globally for our own for our own pleasure what it is of travel it's not just business it's about our pleasure yeah well, this is, uh, this is making me think that really that sort of understanding the travel insurance sector and what it's doing is going to be really key to getting people back out there again. Um, can you, pull your, can you pull your brilliant travel insurance people together, Jen, and do a webinar and throw a million questions at them? <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking I, um, there is one that um, from the TTC that I'll, I'll probably pull in and maybe I'll try to get a World Nomads. Um, yeah in as well to kind of like the the big perspective because haven't they just pulled all cover they're not uh, not allowing any policies in the mail world nomads they're not covering anyone 
Yeah. So it's like, there's, yeah. And it, that's, it's like, but they can't freeze forever. They have they must have a plan of like, mm. or, or they must be working on some sort of guidelines or else they're basically shutting down permanently as well. And so. Um, It'd be good from a consumer insurance point of view and a corporate insurance point of view just to see where the two fields are sitting so we, we we're not looking for you know a legal framework set out by them it's just ideas for the future so we can think yeah exactly no i think that's a really good idea and i'm wondering as well like coming up with you know because somebody's got to come up with these frameworks and policies and guidelines and and since it's not out there um might as well start having those conversations and start proposing them and like with any new thing, you need people who are willing to test them out. So, uh, yeah. you know, presumably they'll they'll want to start with the people that are the safest to insure, because that's usually the best place to go. Right? So, yeah. so let's see if we can uh, we can get Yuli clients on the list of uh, yeah, absolutely <laughs> <ones to> insure. <laughs> Will we crash test dummies? Just yeah. don't take us to court afterwards. <laughs> um, but no, that's a really good idea, actually. I think um, I will, I'll reach out and, and try to pull that together because I think that's, um, I had been thinking it's about the traveler not being confident to travel and government's restricting, but absolutely, it's going to, they're going to want to, but they're going to need to get insurance and that's going to be that sort of, because yeah. you require it, right? So they can't yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, from the moment people book the trip, they need their travel insurance in case all this happens, you know, when yeah. when when refunds aren't issued on flights or credits expire over a year and things like that, that travel insurance needs to cover them. But again, COVID related incidents at the moment are saying that, you know, the pandemic wasn't overly written into the policies, force majeures were. And this is something that is now going to be totally enclosed in someone's travel insurance policy. And we need that from the moment they book their trip with us. Yeah, all right. Awesome. I will definitely pull that together. Um, the other one that we've been sort of pondering is is just knowing where you can go. Um, so, you know, do you guys know of any place, like any way to say, um, like obviously right now the answer is no, you can't go anywhere. Uh, but let's say three months from now when stuff starts to open up again, you know what what is the resource to if you're a traveler to know where you can go or are you counting on people like you to sort of be across that uh we get our weekly update from um the australian government it's on smart traveler and yeah. all it is at the moment is more countries that are saying do not enter do not come do not come there's mm -hmm. not been yet many green lights that have said okay we are willing to accept people i think the only caveats in there are for uh, relatives who are in states of distress through health related yeah. issues or funerals i think i think that's the, that's the only global movement i can see happening at the moment is really about that sort of stuff and healthcare workers and i imagine heads of governments and things that are in their own planes so but that's the only thing i can see at the moment no i don't see a lot of a lot of uh it'd be nice to know who is the authoritative body we have to re refer to to work out when and how we can move i think that's obviously going to be state you know national governments because mm. i have this like dream of going to places that are not crowded you know mm. and like so i kind of want to like you know the like the week after it opens up like i want to be there before the crowds arrive right <laughs> isn't the catch 22 though we all have to go through a hub in some form we have to go through a transport hub that takes us into the you know middle of the spider's nest before we can get out to the the, the beautiful webs at the side of it uh, that's and the true. risk of getting caught up is the problem you know and until they put perspex tunnels or private enclosures into check-in points and security areas and all that sort of stuff in airports that's going to be the risk factor to get into any of these wilderness areas is to get to the himalayas we need to go through singapore or dubai or bangkok and right. that's where the crux is going to happen that's where the most regulation needs to happen to protect these places and us mm, which is why it's good to see the airlines starting to test test out testing right that you have to yeah get tested before you can even get on the plane so um I, I'm intrigued to see how that rolls out because then that can be rather than you having to get them to test, it's like the airline basically offers mm. that as a service. Yeah. Uh, that that you get tested on the way through and then that gives you a little bit of confidence that people who have fevers and are testing positive just don't get on the planes with you. I mean it might even be that it's a local GP has to give you a test forty eight hours out 
and that is your document you need to carry to travel to to, to ch check in even before yeah. they do their own checks. And I've seen these mock-ups, these artist impressions of an Emirates A380 almost looks like theatre staff who've got the masks and the full PP gear on. Yeah. To actually then serve you nothing on board because you take your own snacks with you in the future. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a whole. It's like walking into a theatre that's in the air. Yeah. And to be honest, I think that might be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never liked the food anyway. <laughs> um, well, thank you um, for for joining this morning, and um, you know, I think I think it's an excellent idea to talk more about the insurance aspect of it. So I think that'll be our our next conversation. Um, but yeah, I I wish that I lived in Queensland because I would totally go on your trip with you. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. At some point, we will do. Don't worry. All right. And good luck to everyone around the world. The light is coming. Don't stress. We are getting there. It's just going to be a long, slow process. And we just got to be happy in what falls very close to our tree at the moment. And then we'll go and get the fruit from overseas after that. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Cheers, Jen. See you guys. Bye-bye.